everyone. My name is Dr. Isabel Krishagal, and I'm a thoracic oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Welcome to Lung Cancer Conversations. We're here to discuss extensive stage small cell lung cancer and why it's critical to make an early diagnosis and start rapid therapy for our patients. This is a highly aggressive disease and we really need to catch this quickly and treat fast. We are gonna start with a clinical case. He's 71 years old, Caucasian, currently smokes and has a 35 pack year history of smoking. He was admitted to the hospital after presenting with progressive shortness of breath and cough for two months. He was initially treated for left-sided pneumonia. A diagnostic bronchoscopy and biopsy of the left-sided lung mass revealed small cell lung cancer. Dr. Ori, as a radiation oncologist, what's your role in this setting? We would uh, see the patient and follow up and uh, discuss the role of radiation, if not needed urgently upfront, uh, then probably after the initial systemic therapy. And I think in a way, it's almost nice to have a patient that's diagnosed while they're in-house, right? Because we can see their labs real time, we can, we can examine them real time, we can talk to them, we can expedite imaging and in a way expedite their workup, which we know is essential in small cell lung cancer. So um, that kind of leads me towards Dr. Shostak as our interventional pulmonologist. What is your role in regards to this? I view my approach twofold. One is to facilitate a diagnosis and one is to um, address any type of uh, palliative symptoms to improve the patient's performance status, allow them to get on systemic therapy. You and I have shared a couple of these cases before. We're gonna get on the phone and say, all right, so this patient's presenting with a pleural effusion, they're having these symptoms. How can we both diagnose them and treat their symptoms at the same time? So important, and I'm so happy to hear that this panel understands urgency. So as this case develops more, unfortunately his pleural effusion is drained, but he experiences rapid reaccumulation of this fluid. Symptoms reoccur, the fluid is back, he requires hospitalization, and treatment initiation is needed as soon as possible. So um, I'm gonna turn to you, uh, Ms. Rivera. What's your role as a nurse navigator here to help this man? Well, in these cases, the role of the nurse navigator is very important. As you see, communicating and trying to translate to the patient what is happening, because everything is happening so fast. So not only navigate, also um, make myself available for the patients and families uh, to try to help them to understand what is happening, what is going to happen, and um, help also the communication between the team as well. And hopefully, you know, we explain this in ways that a patient can understand at a patient level, but sometimes as a practitioner, we don't always have that opportunity. Yes, and sometimes you talk to the patient as everything goes on the side. They cannot absorb everything. And then they start thinking, and this is when they come with the questions. So we want to move this patient, stabilize them, and get them to the clinic. How do you bridge that? And they communicate with me and make sure that they have all the appointments lined up after, then make sure that it's gonna have in in timely manner the next cycle is scheduling. That's huge. I feel like the patients are so lucky to have someone like you because I don't know if that's possible. Like you're at a big academic institution, you're at Montefiore, you know, you have somebody that's diagnosed in a community setting. I don't know if they have all of that. They're lucky if they make the diagnosis during that admission. And, and this is the truth. And unfortunately, this is what happens. This is someone that you definitely need to press your pathologist and get the report and find out what this histology is, because this sounds like somebody that may need treatment in-house. I've seen patients with small cell get treated in the ICU. This cancer is really radiosensitive and very chemosensitive. So we really need to try to push, push the team to get this diagnosis to be made, right? Um, and then that kind of bridges us towards, you know, treatment in-house when this patient also has symptomatic bone mets. Um, Dr. Ori and Dr. Rose, how do you kind of duke it out to see, you know, do we treat these painful bone mets because I can get them done one, two, three, five fractions, or do we give them one cycle, or how do you figure that timing out? I mean, this, this is never easy. I feel like I would usually get the call from interventional pulmonary, and they'd say, hey, this is a small cell diagnosis, and then, yeah, immediately I'm going to get on the phone with my radiation oncologist and say, how do we approach this best? Which is the right uh, first level of care? And it's not always clear, right? Generally, in, the, in this patient with extensive stage disease, we tend to shy away from concurrent therapy. So uh, if cycle one of chemotherapy is gonna be started, I would generally hold off on palliative radiation unless there was some extreme need, like something involving the spinal cord. What, what is, what's the group's experience with uh, palliative care, uh, even at the time of the initial diagnosis? 
um, and when do you get them involved? In an ideal world, palliative care is involved regardless of your stage. But in regards to reality, anytime you mention palliative care, I find that the patient sometimes shuts down, right? Or they think, oh, that's it. Doc, you're giving up on me. I'm done. I'm, that's it. So it's almost reframing how you, you, how you explain what this team is and what their goal is. And, and we often call them the symptom management team or the symptom care team. Um, so that it doesn't sound so doom and gloom. So that's been my approach. I bring them in as quickly as I can when it feels natural. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Dr. Preschool. And I think often in small cell and especially extensive stage small cell patients, they often get involved early because these patients often prevent very, present very symptomatically and they often need opioid pain medications, breathing support, uh, bowel support, a lot of different things that have to come on very quickly. Yeah, I, I uh, echo it. Uh, the team here has said I've really never uh, made a palliative care referral and, and regretted it. I feel like they have so much to offer. We're very spoiled. I have an embedded palliative care physician in my clinic who I can work very closely with and we have great inpatient access to this. But in the community, they may not have as much access to palliative care and specialists in this area. Um, so I think it's really important for us to educate about these important uh, critical symptoms. And then again, the, the, the era of virtual consults. We can bring in a palliative care specialist to give some care input a community oncologist can prescribe opioids and other supportive medications. And then, Ms. Rivera, I, I'm sure that you you have a lot of experience in this space, and, and I feel like there are times where sometimes my nurse will come in and just be like, listen, I think, I think it's time to really have the talk. Sometimes I have to bring it down and say, I think that is sufficient now. We had to discuss with the patient and, and, and try to make them comfortable and and spend the most time with the family. The physician-provider relationship is very intimate. And sometimes we get very involved in our patients' care and their outcomes. And sometimes that can be very difficult. And sometimes patients will share stuff with, with a different person that they won't share with me. There's something they, they, they want to make sure that they're not, I hate to say this, but they've told me they don't want to disappoint me. They don't want to let me down. And that breaks my heart that they're not, they don't want to share that with you sometimes. So it is sometimes having that third party come in and say, hey, there is this elephant in the room we need to talk about really can trigger that conversation. Yes, that happened very often. Yes. The patients, sometimes they open more with me than with the doctor because they don't want to disappoint him when he's eager to continue. And that's... Um, my, one of my other roles, trying to help transition and help to communicate each other. Let's talk a little bit about whole brain radiation. Absolutely. So we're talking about the use of radiation to manage brain metastases, which is quite common in many malignancies, particularly small cell lung cancer. Uh, when we give cranial radiation, one big concern is causing cognitive changes, which could be things like short-term memory loss, typically may be first noticed four to six months after radiation is given and, and can be permanent. Uh, so that's a big thing we try to avoid. So well said, and thank you for your comments. Really appreciate it. That was a great discussion on extensive stage small cell lung cancer. Uh, this is a difficult disease, uh, one that is uh, patients are presenting symptomatically. So identifying the disease early, acquiring tissue using a multidisciplinary team, and oftentimes starting patients on treatment rapidly. We heard from you, Dr. Pichigal, that these are patients that are oftentimes diagnosed in the hospital standard of care regimen for patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer is chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And then lastly, I think, you know, including our supportive care oncology team, as well as our nursing team is critical in this patient population, given the morbidity as well as, you know, significant mortality from this disease. While most of these patients do present inpatient, making sure we have a really smooth transition to the outpatient setting with the nurse navigators and other team members to continue that fluid care. Couldn't agree more. It's a multidisciplinary disease that requires a multidisciplinary approach. So, so well said by all of you. And thank you so much. <laughs>